Before we start our training program, let's take a look back at the early development of the generator. Prior to the invention of a mechanical device to produce electricity, its main use was in electrochemistry and early battery powered telegraph machinery. By this time, a great deal was known about the relationship between magnetism and electricity. Static electricity could be generated whilst the natural effects of lightning were well known. Electricity could be stored for short periods in a Leyden jar, which was the early forerunner of the capacitor. In Faraday's experiments, electromagnetic rotations, he produced the basis of a rotating electrical motor, as well as demonstrating the interrelationship between electrical current and magnetic fields. The effect produced both the rotation of a magnetic pole around a conductor on the left-hand side and the rotation of a conductor around a magnetic pole on the right-hand side. Faraday's achievements in 1831 gradually led to the production of practical machines for converting mechanical power into electrical energy, dynamos, magnetos and alternators, and electrical energy to mechanical energy through motors. Here we see Faraday's original coil and magnet from the 17th of October 1831. Faraday discovered that when he thrust a bar magnet into a helix of copper wire connected to a galvometer, he obtained a deflection of the needle. Faraday's disc generator, produced by the 28th of October 1831, demonstrated that by rotating a copper disc with the edge near the poles of a powerful magnet, Faraday found he could draw off a steady current by connecting a galvometer to the central spindle and to a copper contact rubbing the periphery of the disc. In July 1832, an oscillating setup was made by Salvatore Dal Negro of Padua in Italy. The arrangements included four coils on a table and four small magnets on a carriage that could be advanced up to the coils then withdrawn mechanically. Clearly this setup was not practical but served to demonstrate the principle. The first electromechanical generator employing rotation was invented by H. Pixie of Paris in 1832. In this first generator, a permanent magnet of the horseshoe type was rotated about a vertical axis by means of a hand crank and gearing. Immediately above the magnet were the poles of a wire wound soft iron core fixed in a suspended frame. The terminals of the winding were connected to a commutator. The machine produced rapid succession of sparks when cranked. As Pixie's first machine generated AC, at the suggestion of Ampere, a commutator was added to provide at least a unidirectional current, although undulating. A magnetoelectric machine made by Saxon using a mercury bath commutator was displayed in June 1833. The machine had a horizontal horseshoe magnet. The armature consisted of a four-armed soft iron cross. A soft iron core carrying the coil was attached to each arm. The four-pole armature rotated on a horizontal spindle opposite the end of the magnet. The rotation was provided by a belt from a vertical pulley and hand crank. This machine demonstrated the term ampere turns as different windings produced differing output potentials. This machine received the approval of Faraday, Daniel and Whetstone. London instrument maker Edward M. Clark also became active in the production of dynamos. He produced a machine utilising two output windings of differing turns. He described one as the quantity coil. The quantity coil produces large brilliant sparks, induces magnetism, ignites gunpowder, produces rotary motion of delicate suspended wire frames round poles of a vertical horseshoe magnet, and produces scintillation from a small steel file. Whilst he describes the intensity coil as... No person out of the hundreds who have touched it could possibly endure the intense agony it is capable of producing. It deflects a gold leaf electroscope and can charge a laden jar. During this period, several individuals were working on dynamo design. Many displayed at the 1851 exhibition. By now, other applications of electricity were electroplating and the production of industrial electromagnets for lifting loads. By 1850, the development of dynamos depended upon their perceived application as a source of electricity for powering lighthouses and electroplating. The most important design of the era were due to Frederick Hale Holmes. The first of his designs was a two horsepower machine. 
The rotor consists of six wheels, each carrying six compound permanent magnets, a total of 36. The frame consists of five rings, each carrying 24 coils. A direct current output was obtained through a large commutator. The success of the trial resulted in Holmes receiving an order for two machines, with the stipulation that the driving speed must not exceed 90 revolutions per minute. Holmes complied with modifying the design so the magnets were stationary. He used 60 magnets that were carried on three vertical planes. Two coil carrying wheels, each with 80 coils, rotated at 90 RPM. Each of the two horsepower machines were driven by a steam engine through a belt drive. On December 8, 1858, at South Foreland High Lighthouse, the first electric power lighthouse illuminated the sea. By this time, various excitation systems existed for dynamos, depending upon the application. These were either self-excited, where the field cores were energised by current from the generator itself, or separately excited, where the field excitation current was supplied externally, either from a battery or a primary dynamo. The dynamo output voltage would have been controlled through a variable rheostat. The voltage produced by a shunt generator shown here is practically independent of the current taken by the external circuit. In a series generator, the field is connected in series with the armature and the external circuit. The coils consist of a few turns of heavy wire having a low resistance in order to carry the whole current from the armature to the external circuit. In this type of generator, the output voltage increases as the load increases, for when more current is taken from the machine, more goes through the field coils, thus causing a stronger magnetic field. A compound generator has both shunt and series fields wound on the same poles. When wound in such a direction that it helps the shunt field, the series field may be designed just to have enough strength to overcome the slight decrease in voltage with increasing load of a shunt machine when wound in the opposite direction. This will give a definite voltage drop with increasing load. This feature is desirable in certain applications. In March 1867, Wilde produced a self-exciting machine, which built up from residual magnetism in its core. This became the principle of series and shunt-wound windings, and were universally adopted. For his DC dynamo, Graham replaced the tooth-ring armature of early designs with the uniform ring-wound armature that came to be known as the Graham ring. His DC dynamo attracted great attention at the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia and quickly became a commercial success. This greatly improved the stability of the output current. In 1871, with his associate Hippolyte Fontaine, Graham opened a factory that manufactured electrical devices and set the standards for the industry. Graham's dynamo was used commercially for both electroplating and electric lighting. At the Vienna exhibition in Austria in 1873, Graham showed that when run in reverse, his dynamo also functioned as an electric motor. Graham's dynamo of 1870 was soon deemed to be a sound commercial proposition to put down small installations to illuminate large public areas. The invention of the incandescent lamp for houses was not to be around for a further five years. The Houses of Parliament and Royal Palaces soon became illuminated by carbon arc lamps and in the USA Wallace and Brush also installed dynamos and arc lamps for wide open public areas. The development in 1879 of the incandescent electric light bulb by Joseph Swan and Thomas Edison was to have far reaching effects because it launched the electrical supply industry which eventually led to an unprecedented demand for power. Line shafting in mills with associated losses in bearings were replaced by electric motors, allowing mechanical movement and lighting in remote installations. What is considered to be the first public electrical supply in Britain was started in Godalming in 1881. This small hydro-powered system was abandoned in 1884 as unprofitable and the community reverted back to gas lamps. The honour of priority should be given to a system in Brighton in 1882 which was powered by a 12 horsepower Roby engine running at 900 RPM driving a brush arc light dynamo with an output of 10.5 amps at 800 volts. 
From such small beginnings, it could hardly be thought that the electrical supply industry soon will be forcing ground for the development of steam power and indeed that one day it will make the reciprocating steam engine itself redundant in textile mills and industry everywhere. The design of the reciprocating steam engine changed in three key areas for the electrical supply industry size, speed of rotation and type of engine to cope with increasing load fluctuations. Early dynamos were belt driven to increase the rotational speed. Early examples were in 1884 at the South Eastern Brush Electrical Company Limited in Colchester and a Westinghouse alternating machine installed in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1887 at 1650 RPM. Losses within these belts could be between 5 and 10 percent. Smaller, higher speed engines could produce the same amount of power as their larger slower counterparts. The idea of using multipole generators originating in Germany were becoming widely used. In 1884, a high speed villain steam engine, originally patented for a steam launch, quickly became used within the power supply industry in the UK. These were used to drive dynamos direct, either for lighting systems or to provide DC excitation current for the main alternators. The success of the engine was probably down to the forced lubrication system. Quickly, many other similar engines appeared. Sebastian Ferranti was appointed chief engineer of the Grosvenor House station in 1886. By this time, the power station had outgrown demand, and complaints over the noise of the large machines led to the sighting of the newly formed London Electric Supply Company's power station at Deptford in London. This site was away from houses and provided a source of cooling water and transportation of coal required by the boilers. Many improvements ensued. Alternating current emerged as a challenger to direct current during the last two decades of the 19th century. In that period, the field of electrical engineering experienced phenomenal growth following the introduction of the incandescent lamp. Alternating current was used for early arc lamps as it ensured equal burning of the two carbon electrodes. Direct current held the field for a number of years. For a number of reasons, one of the strongest arguments is DC permitted the use of standby batteries ensuring reliability of customer service and providing a nighttime supply when the generators were shut down. However, the scales were tipped in favour of alternating current with the emergence of two inventions. The transformer, which allowed electricity to be transported over large distances, and the induction motor. Both devices were developed in the last decade of the 19th century. Both AC and DC systems were still in operation as recent as the 1960s. Soon, the Westinghouse alternating current system, rather than Edison's more expensive, higher maintenance and less efficient direct current system, began to get most of the orders. Another advantage with the alternating system soon became apparent by allowing central stations to serve wider markets. The AC system also encouraged utilities to build larger power stations, which then benefited from economics of scale and lowering their operating costs. In 1893, the Westinghouse AC system was chosen to move electric power from the Niagara Falls to Buffalo. Shortly after that, the Westinghouse AC universal system became the new standard for transmitting electricity. Now, one generating station could transmit power relatively cheaply over a wide service area. Increasing demand for electricity at the depth of power station led to the need for larger prime movers and alternators. Charles Parsons about this time developed the steam turbine which ran somewhat faster and smoother than the original reciprocating steam engines and at a considerably smaller size. AC generators in the future will be driven from a variety of engines including diesel, conventional combustion engines and gas turbines. All AC generators, now known as alternators to distinguish them from dynamos, had stationary stator windings fitted around the rotor. In order to produce electricity, a rotating shaft contained an electromagnet turned within the stator winding. Low speed alternators would be multipoled to match the speed of the engine. These were known as salient pole machines, as pole bricks were bolted to the rotor shaft. With the advent of steam turbines running at speeds of 3000 RPM for 50 Hz operation, the Brown Bavaria Company in 1903 
designed a system of embedding the rotor windings within the shaft of the rotor to overcome frictional losses and lower vibration levels. This offered mechanical support to the generator rotor windings when subjected to high centrifugal forces at such high running speeds. These machines are in current production today. In order to regulate the output voltage of the machine, the DC current within the rotor would have to be supplied and varied as load fluctuations appeared on the generator output. The low voltage high current DC supply required for the rotor field winding could be provided in two ways, either through slip rings or through a DC exciter which effectively was a dynamo. Many of these were self-regulating but still required slip rings to operate. The advent of high power semiconductor rectifiers led to the demise of the DC exciter, after which the brushless excitation system took over, whereby a shaft mounted AC generator rectifier assembly, using no electrical connections between the rotating shaft and the stator frame, provided the alternator's excitation supply. Most modern generators employ an automatic voltage regulator to maintain the machine's excitation supply. 